there really are substantial changes in these guidelines compared to the last guidelines from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine 12 years ago. And those updates have to do with new data on some medications, um, some new medications, and the really the most dramatic change that I think is going to surprise people that the task force came up, uh, decided on, is that uh, dopamine agonists, which have previously been considered first-line therapies for restless leg syndrome, are no longer considered first-line. In fact, we conditionally recommend against their use in restless leg syndrome. The reason why this is, is because there's increasing data over these last 10 to 15 years about the appearance of what's called augmentation, which is a worsening of restless leg syndrome and iatrogenic worsening due to these medications. Although they're wonderful in the short term, over the long term, they make symptoms worse, make them more severe. They are present many more hours a day and they extend from the lower extremities up to the upper extremities. So we are now recommending against their use, uh, except in certain circumstances where other agents are not effective or not tolerated. The good news is that there are good medications over the long term. And prominently, these include the class of alpha-2 delta calcium channel ligands. And so that would include gabapentin, gabapentin enocarbyl, and pregabalin, which have demonstrated in a number of randomized controlled trials, including those head-to-head -head with dopamine agonists, good efficacy and the absence of that augmentation. In addition, we uh, had a strong recommendation for IV iron in those individuals whose ferritin was less than 100 or transferrin saturation was less than 20%. So that gives us quite a number of opportunities there. Uh, we also had conditional recommendations for oral iron, um, a variety of different kinds of IV iron, uh, dipyridamol, which is an old agent used in cardiology back in the old days, which has a, a successful RCT for RLS. Um, mu opioid agonists with one very large controlled trial of oxycodone extended release showing substantial benefits for RLS. And finally, um, the use of bilateral high-frequency coronial nerve stimulation which also has shown benefit in refractory arteries. So a lot of good choices, but we don't feel that the dopamine agonists are a good first line choice. And the task force um, was very clear about that. Well, with every patient, always, you're having a collaborative decision-making process. It's not me saying you should take this. Um, I'm presenting options. They're driving, I'm in the seat next to them. And so we, just like the task force, we balance efficacy and side effects or complications. And so what I do is I say, there are a number of really good options for restless leg syndrome, a number of them. And I'll go through the alpha two delta calcium channel ligands and say, these medications have proven efficacy in moderate to severe RLS. And there are a few of them that are available. They can have these kinds of side effects. And what do you think about those side effects? We can start very low in you and take our time. And um, they, um, for the majority of people, are going to provide significant benefits. Similarly, I always say to people, we really need to get iron studies on you, serum iron, 
because restless legs is a brain iron deficiency. And we can't stick sharp needles in your brain, but we can get some blood and see whether we think iron, whether orally or IV, can be of value. And uh, based on that, the good news is that uh, iron formulations generally don't have a lot of side effects. The oral formulation probably has more than the IV uh, with stomach upset. IV is um, really has few, uh, if any, side effects. The old story about uh, anaphylaxis was with an agent that is no longer on the market. And um, the issue is just getting it approved by your insurance company. And we need to give a lot of iron, a thousand milligrams of iron for it to be effective. So we'd say that there are a number of options. I will mention the dopamine agonists, but say the concern is with these medicines, even though you're going to love them, there's going to be a honeymoon and you're going to be sending me chocolates next week because of their immediate benefit. Over the long term, these medicines make things worse. If you're the kind of person who thinks that short-term benefits outweigh long-term complications and side effects, well, maybe that's the right medicine for you. But from my perspective, I don't think it's a good choice. What I would say is the task force consisted of about eight, of eight members. We looked at over 5,000 papers in, that addressed RLS treatments. We only extracted those that were, we thought, of a certain quality. And we went into great detail on them, did meta-analyses on them. And these recommendations are very carefully thought out in terms of the balance of benefits and risks, immediate risks, side effects, long-term risks, augmentation. And we have now recommended a number of agents as first-line therapy, the alpha-2 deltas, uh, IV iron, a number of agents as second-line therapies. But we are recommending that people not start patients um, unless you're very clear about the long-term augmentation risk um, on dopamine agonists. We did not address the question uh, what do you do with people who are on dopamine agonists now? And people who don't have augmentation, what do you do? People who do have augmentation. And that's really a separate question, uh, one that I have written about extensively, but is not, is not in the guidelines per se.